Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Medical Staff Leaders and Professionals Protect Your Organization from Negligent Credentialing Legal Action. I am Ayla Ellison with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. We will also have a short survey during today's webinar. You are free to fill out the survey at any point of the webinar, which is available in the menu doc. Thank you in advance for your participation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. Before we begin, please note that the purpose of this webinar is informational only. Please consult a professional advisor for specific medical, legal, financial, or other advice. This webinar is copyrighted by the American Medical Association. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Carol Cairns is a healthcare consultant, speaker, author, and expert witness specializing in medical staff organizations, credentialing, privileging, and survey preparation. Her more than 45-year career in medical staff affairs has included roles with the Joint Commission, the Greeley Company, HC Pro, and NCQA. Additionally, she has served on the Board of Directors, Bylaws, and Credentialing Committee of Present St. Joseph Medical Center in Joliet, Illinois, and on the Present Central and Suburban Hospitals Network Board of Directors. Carol is a recurring presenter for the AMA Credentialing Insights webinar series. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Carol to begin today's presentation. Thank you very much, Ayla. I want to welcome all of our attendees. We have a large number of you across the country. We also have uh, a number of uh, different um, areas of, of specialty. So we have physicians, we have medical service professionals, we have CEOs, attorneys, board members. Um, lots of uh, medical staff leaders and so on. So I welcome you all. This is um, a topic extremely near and dear to my heart. Um, we're going to talk about, I've been working in the field of negligent credentialing for the last 20 plus years um, when I got my first phone call from an attorney saying, we have a negligent credentialing case. And uh, I said, okay, explain that a little bit to me. Uh, and I've been learning about this very specialized area ever since. So in order to orient, some of you in my audience are, are attorneys, so you know very well a lot of these things uh, and could give this um, webinar. Uh, and then others of you are sort of new to it. So we're gonna talk about what is a tort. We're gonna talk about some landmark cases very quickly and why they are still setting a precedent that we follow today. We're gonna talk about four particular cases that I picked out uh, of where I was involved and the lessons that I think are valuable to learn. And then we're going to talk about what medical staff leaders can do and medical staff professionals can do to try to avoid these situations. One of the things that has been happening lately, uh, and as I said earlier, I've been doing this for, for 20 years plus, and lately it's almost exponential. It's like a volcanic <laughs> eruption of negligent credentialing cases. Um, this has become a very specialized area for experts to uh, function in. Sometimes some of us are attorneys, some of us are uh, physicians, some of us are uh, medical service professionals. But this is a very specialized area of knowledge. And, and my opinion about why has this happened there's two areas. One, hospitals are employing more and more physicians or contracting with them. In the old days, we uh, just contracted with uh, pathologists, radiologists, ER physicians, and now we're contracting. Many hospitals have almost uh, their full medical staff that they employ or contract with. And we're also contracting with our advanced practice professionals. We're employing them. And in each instance, um, malpractice can occur and also uh, with that could be a charge of negligent credentialing. With the practitioners, we have a limited amount of dollars um, that plaintiff's attorneys can seek, but in the organization, in the systems, in the hospitals, there are much larger dollars to be had, and I think both of those 
circumstances has created the upswing in, um, in negligent credentialing cases. We have a lot of names for negligent credentialing. You see a number of them there. Corporate negligence and institutional negligence tends to come more with those situations that are physician, uh, where the physician or the practitioner is an employee or contracted with the organization. Um, different areas, different uh, states, different uh, attorneys call it different things. The four requirements of a tort is extremely important to understand so that we can understand that just because harm happens to a patient does not necessarily mean, or harm can happen to a practitioner, which I'll demonstrate in a little bit, does not mean it's negligent credentialing. So what has to happen um, from my experience is that in the case of a patient that's been harmed, First, the, the, or, or, there's two parts to the allegations, to the, um, to the complaint. One is that malpractice has occurred, and the second part is that this malpractice occurred because of negligent credentialing. So as we work through the components of a tort, uh, hopefully it's easier to understand. First, we talk about a duty existed. So in the patient care scenario, the doctor, the nurse practitioner had a duty to take care of the patient. The hospital has a duty to take care of the patient in a safe manner according to norms. That duty was then breached. So they allege and they will try to prove that the standard of care was not met, the, um, the nicked bladder, the, the um, incision, um, got infected, et cetera, those things shouldn't happen, and therefore the duty to take care of that patient was uh, breached. The breach caused harm is the third part. So just because the patient received a medication that uh, was not adequately ordered or appropriately ordered, but if it didn't cause harm, then that's still not a tort. The breach causes harm and then there is damages. So the patient has lost life, limb, ability to work, um, function, and so on. So those four components have to be proven by the plaintiff in order for a tort to exist. So when we take that malpractice claim and we now add the layer of negligent credentialing, what's the duty? The duty is, according to federal and state law, and uh, hospital bylaws and, and accreditation organizations, the medical staff uh, and its governing body have a duty to credential and privileges, privilege competent physicians and other practitioners. If that duty is breached, so how do they decide it's breached? Well, they utilize the standards, the norms that are out there. Again, federal law, accreditation organization standards, and the organization's bylaws, rules, regulations, and policies. So they didn't follow them. Or they use the standard of care, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But just like physicians and, and in the medical profession, we have standards of care, which is what would most physicians do in this scenario. What would most organizations, what's the national norm in verifying licenses from all states, let's say, for example? The breach then caused harm. So because the medical staff and the governing body did not follow the standard of care or the, the regulations, then a patient was harmed. And that harm was sufficient enough to, to, uh, pro to provide some damages to that patient. So all of those pieces have to be met first for the malpractice, and then, and this is in a patient uh, negligent credentialing scenario, and then once again, all of those need to be met uh, again for the negligent credentialing. What are some of the landmark cases? And again, we're only going to spend a couple minutes on these. Uh, this is an Illinois case, Darling versus Charleston Community Hospital. And to set the, and it goes all the way back to 1965. At that time, hospitals were uh, considered uh, immune. There was a charitable immunity for hospitals. Essentially, hospitals considered themselves the workshop of physicians. Physicians were uh, predominantly never employed. They were independent practitioners. They practiced out in the community. And they brought their patients to us 
and we considered ourselves the place where the doctors did this work. But we felt at that time that um, we were immune because we didn't practice medicine. The argument was doctors practice medicine. However, our young uh, darling came in, a uh, football player who was injured, uh, had, fractured, uh, had a fractured leg, came into the emergency room, a doctor on call, treated him. In those days, um, this is kind of the person on call. He hadn't set a fracture in three years, hadn't treated one. And the patient's record began to identify uh, b blue toes, um, foul-smelling odor, and patient was transferred, and unfortunately, he lost his leg. Um, family sued. That was the first case that, after a jury uh, heard the case, they awarded $150,000. Now, that was big money then. It was enough for everybody to say, wow, let's talk about this. This is a complete change from our charitable immunity. But the interesting part of this case is that 80% of that award was directed at the hospital and only 20 at the physician, 20%. So right there you see all of a sudden there is a sea change. As we go forward, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, at, that ended the charitable immunity, and it also was a legally enforceable standard that said hospitals, board of directors, whether you're physicians or not, you are responsible for monitoring, supervising, and controlling the care that's within your facility. Gonzalez versus Nork is another case, and this is my favorite case to talk about. I could go on and on about Gonzalez versus Nork, and I'm not going to do that now, but it happened in 1973. Nork was a well-trained orthopedic surgeon uh, who was appointed to, the, to Mercy Hospital. Mercy did not query other hospitals where Nork had practiced. This was back in 1973, where a lot of organizations didn't do that. And there had been peer review issues, but they didn't know about it. And they did not query his malpractice carrier to find out about previous cases. In the meantime, Nork performed a laminectomy on Albert Gonzalez, a 27-year-old man injured in an auto accident. The procedure resulted in significant complications, and Gonzalez sued Nork for malpractice and the hospital for negligence. During discovery, he proved that the indications for the laminectomies at another, in his case were questionable, and he presented evidence that in the nine years before, Nork had performed 36 unnecessary and or injurious laminectomies. When this case ended up with a judge making a decision on it, the judge wrote <laughs> an unprecedented 196-page opinion, and he ordered Gonzalez, he ordered Mercy to pay Gonzalez $1.7 million and Nork $2 million. So the hospital was almost as liable as Nork. So once again, it established that hospitals have that responsibility, do care, means verifying information on the application. You just don't accept what is said there, but rather it's verified. And the most important part of this case that I think is absolutely relevant today, almost 50 years later, is that final bullet that talks about knew or should have known. That judge, in, in the opinion, said that Mercy either knew or should have known what the situation was. Now, that's a serious issue because, in fact, they didn't do it. They didn't explore. The reason it, that it's pertinent today is there's hardly a case that I either get the complaint or the judge makes certain rulings along the way that says the, the defendant knew or should have known. Those are really simple words that I used in my career multiple, multiple times, and I still do today. Was there information, was there a red flag that this organization should have followed up in its credentialing process? Was there a license, one license that was suspended, one license that was revoked? Maybe not your state license where the doctor's going to practice, but anywhere. And did we check into that? Is that the norm? Should we have known about that? 
um, when there is one peer review case that uh, falls out, so to speak, we, we call it, and we say, well, uh, the care wasn't very good, we could have done better, um, and we notify the doctor. Is there reason to dig deeper? Is there reason to really look at this care of this practitioner or of this unit, let's say, that says maybe we should just check a little bit deeper to make sure that there isn't something that we can do to improve care or to make patients stay safe? Um, that's why I love this case so much is the new or should have known. The hospital board and its medical staff are need to be, the hospital board needs, needs to make sure through its medical staff that clinicians are competent. The hospital can be held liable. And in the instance of uh, perhaps um, malpractice by a physician that's employed by them, they can be also held liable for the malpractice. It just depends on, on the uh, respondent superior and, and uh, the, the laws of the state and, and uh, so on. Um, the breach of this duty occurs when medical staff fail to follow their own governance documents. It's bylaws, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. Um, you can point to state licensing laws for hospitals and what is required. What does, if you're accredited by Joint Commission, HVAP, the accreditors you see on the list, what do they require? What are their standards? And are you assuring that in every instance you are meeting those standards? Because those are the most concrete standards of all. National norms are a little softer, but in fact, do you know what they are? Do you know what most people are recommending? What, what is the standard out, out in the field? Are you establishing delineated criteria for the privileges that you grant? Do those criteria match up to national standards? And are you doing a good faith effort uh, in, in getting information? The next case is Frigo versus Silver Cross, also in Illinois. This was in 2007, and basically this was a nurse, an ICU nurse, who underwent a podiatric procedure with a screw being placed into her foot. Post-op, her foot became severely infected and eventually required an amputation. She therefore could not work as a nurse uh, anymore, and she then sued. Uh, you'll notice that the trial evidence shows that the hospital granted privileges in 1992 and renewed those privileges several times through the reappointment process. However, the podiatrist did not meet the criteria that the medical staff had established, which was either a 12-month podiatric surgical residency program or, or a board certification in podiatric surgery. So. They did not meet their own criteria, and the medical staff and the board continued to recommend this doctor's privileges. And in fact, this patient was harmed. They made no mention, no exception, no monitoring, nothing that said, yes, we recognize that we didn't meet this criteria, that he didn't meet this criteria, but he had some equivalency. There was nothing like that. After a 14-day trial, the jury awarded, if you notice, 7.8 million, but 6.9 of that came from the hospital, and only 900,000 from the podiatrist. So isn't it interesting, once again, that we hold the hospital more responsible than the actual clinician that committed the uh, malpractice uh, procedure? So once again, bylaws, rules, regulations, you're going to hear me say this five times probably as we go on. Bylaws and related criteria need to be followed, and a hospital is negligent when it confers privileges to a physician, or I would broaden that now in a minute, we'll talk about nurse practitioners, uh, without, uh, and I would broaden that to the whole advanced practice uh, professional group. Um, they need to be following their, bio, their internal policies, procedures, bylaws, delineation of privileges, and so on, and the statutory requirements around those. The next case is Cadillac and Lakeview. Um, Cadillac is uh, in Washington State. It's a hospital. And this is where hospital is suing hospital. Uh, and Lakeview uh, is in um, Louisiana. 
This case involved Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry was a uh, anesthesiologist who was impaired. He had a drug abuse issue. He was a um, member of the group of the Lakeview Anesthesia. He was uh, eventually fired and, and uh, lost his privileges because he lost his membership in the group for being uh, for abusing uh, while working. Uh, Cadillac, and there was kind of a history there. It took about three months of uh, of awareness. So once again, we do that new should have known issue. Uh, Dr. Barry went to Cadillac in Washington, and they hired him after receiving a reference letter from Lakeview that didn't say anything about the reasons for dis for uh, termination. But the letter did say, according to our norm, um, he was a member in good standing. Um, or he was a member of the staff. I believe they didn't say good standing. And once again, that's a red flag. We need to be digging at those red flags. Well, he was at that organization for, I believe, nine years. You mean to tell me this is all you can tell us about? But at the same time, um, the Lakeview anesthesia people wrote a glowing recommendation, which you'll see in a second. The physician negligence led to a claim against Cadillac and a 7.5 million settlement. Cadillac then sued, and in this case, it was a 44-year-old patient who um, was having a minor surgical procedure done and ended up in a vegetative state. The award was uh, $7.5 million. Cadillac turned around and sued Lakeview Anesthesia and the medical center because they said, basically, we appointed him because you said he was okay. The trial court found for Cadillac, Lakeview failed in its duty to disclose the impairment. The appellate court then turned around and said, wait a minute, no, I'm not so sure. And they reversed the decision only to find a limited duty to disclose. They basically said, once you write that letter, you have an affirmative responsibility to state the truth, but you don't necessarily have to disclose negative information. Uh, colleagues of mine and, and I believe that there's another Cadillac out there. Um, I believe that the uh, case for, yes, you do have an obligation. If you're going to respond, yes, you do have an obligation to tell what you know uh, honestly. And someday there'll be another Cadillac that'll prove that, I believe. But in the case of the physician, uh, the anesthesia physician, um, they were found uh, responsible, and a colleague of mine interviewed one, uh, a physician involved in this, and his comment was, I'll be paying for this the rest of my life. Um, this physician lied and said, and uh, wrote a glowing recommendation for Dr. Barry, knowing all the while why, why, why he was fired. So who sues? Patients and families sue, we're used to that. Physicians sue for negligent credentialing. I have a case that I picked out and, and we're gonna talk about them in a minute. And other hospitals sue. So for example, the Cadillac uh, versus Lakeview is an example of that. So as we go on, we're gonna now talk about four cases that I pulled out of those that I've worked on um, so that you can get an idea of the types of cases that there are and also the issues that are raised. Um, when I first started doing um, expert witness work for credentialing, I only took defense cases, only defended medical staffs and hospitals against the charges of negligent credentialing. But what I found is sometimes, in fact, um, there has been negligent credentialing, patients have been harmed, and I don't pick a side. Uh, I basically have an opinion and the side picks me as the expert, I'm not, uh, I'm not for or against anyone in the case, I'm just an expert on credentialing. And in fact, defense attorneys would much prefer that I have worked on some plaintiff cases because it makes me uh, uh, appear to be a more objective witness. So this first case is a female patient presented with a knee injury. So she'd had previous knee surgery, she was hiking, she fell and severely injured her knee. They took her by ambulance, she wasn't even in her home state, they took her by ambulance to the hospital and uh, this doctor 
treated this patient. He was a vascular surgeon, uh, treated her conservatively, and so on. She begged to go home. She was stable, and uh, Dr. Uh, allowed her to go home on the caveat that she would immediately seek medical care when she got home. Uh, she didn't. Um, she uh, resisted going to the hospital for a while. Eventually, the, the complications that she had uh, ended up in uh, above the knee amputation of her right leg. The patient sued the attending for failure to diagnose and manage her in a timely manner and the hospital for negligent credentialing of the surgeon, and that surgeon had been on staff for 30 years with an impeccable record. Um, in this case, I was um, on the defense uh, side of things. The hospital, um, we identified all sorts of bylaws, policies, rules, regulations, outlining the way they credential, how they re-credential, what materials they have in their peer review processes. They had excellent OPPE, which is Ongoing Professional Practice Evaluation, OPPE processes. Um, the chief medical officer talked about rounding on nursing stations, wanting to know how uh, care was going. Did the nurses have any issues uh, regarding physician or advanced practice professional uh, care? Um, all of this I was able to glean through their documents and through the testimony, so during the discovery phase, which is the phase between uh, the complaint and the uh, trial, there's discovery. And so the testimonies that you get, the um, depositions that you get, um, I was able to pull out a really good process. The court testimony also uh, corroborated that they had excellent processes um, to identify poor performance. The surgeon did have four other malpractice cases which were settled or tried. One, uh, the surgeon defended uh, appropriately and it, it was found for the surgeon. And three others, there, there were three others that were found for the um, plaintiff, but they were smaller awards, uh, not insignificant, but they were not huge awards and they were also under different circumstance, different types of cases. So no trends in that area. And additionally, this is a busy, uh, well-known uh, vascular surgeon uh, doing a variety of procedures for 30 years. And three cases in 30 years is, um, in many instances, uh, quite good. So uh, the surgeon decided he was at the end of his career when this whole thing happened, and he was actually retiring, I believe, as the as the case was being filed. And he basically said, "I just I, I I want out. I just want this settled, and I want it done." So in fact, uh, there was a settlement there. So that part of the trial didn't occur, but the um, but the negligent credentialing did occur. But based on our presentation of evidence of doing a really good job they found for the defendant. The hospital was found uh, not guilty and uh, the trial ended. So what is the lessons learned in this document, 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 and make sure that everything that you are doing is uh, appropriate, up to date, matching standards, and that you're doing what you're saying you're doing. Many times we say it, but we don't do it. We don't walk that uh, talk. The second case, uh, this is a case where it's a surgeon who was suing the hospital where she had been employed. Uh, in uh, 2010, uh, Dr. Miller, a 56-year-old female general surgeon, was practicing at Huron Regional Medical Center. She had two-year contracts. She was in the midst of her third uh, contract five years into being there. The board chair mentioned prior to the board meeting starting to the medical staff leaders that he had heard some uh, scuttlebutt in the community that, uh, and this board chair was not a clinician, he'd heard scuttlebutt in the community that said that this surgeon's performance was in question. Medical staff said, we don't know anything about that, and the board chair, when the meeting started, asked them, told the board what he had heard, and asked the medical staff to do a 90-day, 100% review of this clinician's work. 
Now, this case went on for years, as you, as you will soon see, and there were many, many twists and turns. It was like a roller coaster. Uh, the Riverview ho roller coaster had nothing on this case. Um, the initial case that was hearsay was never, ever evaluated during the whole time of this case. Uh, that was my first question. What did they find out about the original case? And they didn't have anything. The, at the end of the first 90 days, the medical staff leadership said to the board, everything is good. Yes, we did evaluate her for timeliness and comprehensiveness of medical record keeping, which is what they told her. They did not tell her that they were evaluating her clinical care. And as I testified, every doctor, probably 75% of the doctors in the United States could do a little better job of timeliness and comprehensiveness of medical record keeping. Um, the second 90-day review was completed. The medical staff said, yep, timeliness is improved, comprehensiveness is improved, everything is good, and recommended through the executive committee to the board a cessation of review. Before that recommendation could get to the board, unfortunately, a uh, patient came in uh, to the ER with an acute pancreatitis. She was on call. Patient was taken to surgery, and she asked a, a surgeon who was also monitoring her and a competitor to come with her. Intraoperatively, um, the, the patient was stabilized and then was transferred. Unfortunately, the patient also died due to the circumstances that the patient presented with. The board members, remember this is an employed physician, right? So the board members demanded that the medical staff do something. Parenthetically, the board could have done something. The board through its CEO could have done something. They did not. They asked the medical staff to do it. At the request of the medical staff leaders, the surgeon reduced her privileges and began looking for another position because she had been told by the medical staff leaders, the board is not going to continue your contract. Huron made three reports to the National Practitioner Data Bank regarding care. Those reports then made the surgeon ineligible to work anywhere else because all hospitals had access to that information. They did not give her a right of a hearing. They did not meet the Healthcare Quality Improvement uh, Act standards in, in allowing her to know what the issues were and uh, an investigation process and so on. So she sued in 2012. Yes, I'm talking about 2012. Uh, in 2016, two trials were scheduled. The first trial uh, was called off three days before trial. So imagine the cost of what's going on here, borne by the hospital, uh, the doctor, and uh, everyone else. Uh, the first trial was called off three days before because the defense attorney had a serious illness diagnosed. The second time in uh, December of 2016, the trial uh, commenced one day into trial. On the second day of trial, a juror uh, collapsed. They had arrested and uh, they died in the courtroom with the plaintiff giving CPR along with two other physician witnesses. A third trial was scheduled in 2017. The uh, jury awarded Miller 1.2 million. Uh, that's not much, giving a general surgeon. However, her age had something to do with it. She was 56 when it started. And um, the second thing was it was South Dakota where the wages would be quite different than other metropolitan areas in the country. Uh, the 2017 verdict was appealed and sent to the Eighth Circuit Court. And at that point, we were under appeal when I was submitting these slides. But in fact, I can report that the judge found for Miller and the whole case is now over. But look how long it took. It took years to get this settled. Uh, a terrible lesson for that hospital and its medical staff leadership. Uh, don't confuse membership and privileges with employment contracts. They could have ceased the employment contract any time the board and the CEO wanted, either for or without cause. Follow your bylaws, rules, regulations. One more time, you're hearing me say this and make sure that you're doing all the right things. And the last bullet there is seek knowledgeable legal advice. This is a caveat because the attorney for the hospital was a local attorney, not a uh, medical staff attorney that really knows medical staff law, and he advised them poorly. 
and based on his advice, they made reports to the data bank that should never have been, have been made. Case number three. Um, so it, that was a very interesting case, and in all instances, I use that case a lot because there are a lot of twists and turns within it that steps, things that were done could well have been improved and would not have ended up in this outcome. So it's a great learning case. Next case, um, this is a 19-year-old, so, so <laughs> um, now that we have advanced practice professionals uh, practicing in uh, independent or supervised or collaborating uh, positions, they are, of course, now being sued as well. So in this case, uh, this is a recent one happening at the, at the beginning, uh, culminating at the beginning of this year. This was a 19-year-old uh, college student who had uh, passed out in the dorm, and she, or in her place of residence, and she came to a small rural, she was taken by the ambulance to a small rural hospital. This hospital is part of a big national system, and uh, because it was a small rural hospital, the state licensing regs allowed uh, a nurse practitioner to be providing care in the emergency setting. Uh, this nurse practitioner was a member of a larger uh, group, a emergency medicine group that had a contract with the hospital. The, her supervising physician was at the larger hospital um, that uh, took uh, transfers from this hospital. And so her physician uh, supervisor was on duty at that particular hospital, at the, at the, let's call it the mothership hospital. And this was one of the uh, smaller satellite hospitals. This young 19-year-old uh, uh, was suspected by the nurse practitioner of a uh, possible drug abuse and the effects of the drug abuse. The boyfriend had stated that, no, that's not so. Uh, his girlfriend did not abuse drugs. Um, they still operated on the idea that this was a uh, drug abuse situation. Patient symptoms got worse. Um, difficulty in breathing, accelerated heart rate, so on. And the nurse practitioner, because this patient had in the past had uh, a cardiology consult at a cardiac um, specialty hospital not far, uh, she spoke with the cardiologist about that situation. She did not contact her supervising physician at the mothership hospital, but rather the cardiologist. The doctor, the cardiologist, uh, once again thought that uh, the drug abuse situation was uh, plausible and felt that the patient needed to sleep it off. Patient uh, had a rising heart rate, increased difficulty breathing, was transferred to the system hospital where the, other, where the uh, supervising physician was and unfortunately died shortly after admission. The Death was attributed to a pulmonary embolism. She had been in a car accident months earlier, and uh, two to three months earlier, and in fact, it was felt that the pulmonary embolism was from that. So, uh, and she had had a, you know, a chest injury from the steering wheel. The family sued the nurse practitioner, the supervising physician, the emergency group that they both were employed by, the hospital and the hospital system. Um, it's very difficult to defend in this type of case uh, the death of a 19-year-old college student. It's, it's just really tough. Uh, the plaintiff's alleged malpractice and negligent credentialing, stating the nurse practitioner was uh, providing care outside her license. This is the reason I picked this case to talk about, is that with the increase dramatic increase, exponential increase, of nurse practitioners and PAs working in hospitals, midwives, the whole advanced practice nurse group, um, and PAs. We are seeing more and more care delivered by these individuals, but in my experience, the medical staff leaders do not know enough about the education and training of these practitioners. So in this case, the jury awarded $6 million, uh, divided up among all of those different entities. Um, at question was the state law. So 
when we talk about physicians and their licensing, we know what an MD is or a DO is across the country. We pretty much know that who they are and what they are and what they're licensed to do. Advanced practice nurses, that's not so much true. And physician assistants, that's changing too. So in the old days, physician assistants always had to be supervised. Now there are some states that say they can have a collaborating agreement. Our advanced practice nurses are being allowed by many, many states now to practice independently. So what is the medical staff bylaws? What, is the, what are the privileging criteria for this whole group? Is it defined what direct supervision is? Or is it defined like nobody does it that way? For example, I sometimes read privileges that say direct supervision of uh, these APPs, advanced practice professionals, is directly supervising them. Well, nobody does it that way. But yet their policies, procedures, criteria say that. In this state, um, and this nurse practitioner was a family practice, primary care nurse practitioner. She had 10 years experience in an emergency room. Um, and in this case, she, by state law, could easily practice in the emergency room. But the one word in her licensing was that she treated stable patients. This patient, of course, was considered unstable. So in other states, for example, like in Texas, an acute care nurse practitioner cannot, should not, by license, be working in a primary care office and vice versa. So a primary care nurse practitioner should not be working in, an in a uh, critical care unit in Texas. So it's important to really dig down and spend some time. And one of the ways to really learn about this group of professionals is have them involved in delineation of privileges and criteria. What does competence look like? What does the clinical practice look like? The issue here was she did not call her supervising physician, she called someone else. That was one of the issues. So it should be very clear, and I think in the delineation of privileges, it should be very clear where and who's responsible and what is the, the custom, what is the practice, what's the expectation. The last case is uh, a very unfortunate one. This is a 35-year-old male patient, otherwise very healthy, had a cancerous kidney, uh, went to the urologist. Uh, the urologist said, it's all contained. Uh, I'm going to be able to take the kidney out on an outpatient basis, and you're going to be fine. Unfortunately, the patient died the following day with uh, hemorrhagic conditions. Tragically, the urologist committed suicide within two weeks of the patient's death. This was a type A um, perfect physician, excellent training, excellent background, cared deeply about his patients, written um, documentation in his record and testimony said that he was an exemplary physician for care, always responding to the patient's needs, always responding to physicians' uh, calls for uh, consults and so on. The patient's widow sued the urologist for malpractice and the hospital for negligent credentialing. The plaintiff alleged that the hospital knew and he failed to address the history of disruptive behavior. So this doctor had a long history of disruptive behavior. Um, and what I'll parenthetically say is that is the one of the hardest things in um, medical staff leadership and medical staff professionals' uh, fields to deal with. We all know who they are. They're, every medical staff generally has one, two, three, depends upon how big you are, physicians who just seem to swim upstream all the time, and they always seem to create very disruptive scenarios around them. They, they're just constantly um, in trouble for things that they do. And the rest of them, and they wear the medical staff leadership out, they wear <laughs> the MSPs out. Uh, we get exhausted because what happens is they get themselves into pretty deep trouble and then the medical staff leadership all changes uh, and now we can start all over again. The claim here was that because he was so disruptive, the nurses did not adequately communicate the patient's rapidly deteriorating condition. Had the medical staff dealt with this disruption, this patient would be alive today was the 
with the allegation. The urologist had no malpractice history, despite practicing, I believe, uh, off the top of my head, about 20 years. No issues regarding clinical competence in his record at all. During the discovery, information was produced from a previous hospital where there was clear disruptive behavior going on, both in the hospital as well as in the office setting. That hospital did not tell second hospital where they where uh, Dector was practicing of this behavior. I think had they pursued this, this could have been another Cadillac but with a different outcome. Depositions were given on the negligent credentialing claim by experts. So uh, I was deposed on the defense. Uh, there was a plaintiff's expert and we did not agree with each other. Uh, one week before, on the negligent credentialing piece, one week before trial, the plaintiff pulled the entire complaint of the negligent credentialing from the trial. That was a very surprising outcome, but we believe we discredited and um, made the plaintiff realize that they were not going to win that part of the case. So. That part of the case completely disappeared, and of course that's where the deepest pocket is and that's where the deepest amount of money could have come from. In the malpractice part, one day before trial, the malpractice claim was settled for what I understand to be significant dollars. There's a lot to be learned in this case. Um, following medical staff bylaws, managing disruptive behavior. And managing disruptive behavior is not easy. Medical staff leaders are not trained to manage this. They are trained to be clinicians. They are not trained to manage behavior of other colleagues. So seeking help from HR, from um, attorneys uh, that are knowledgeable in management, this is really, really helpful. Um, doing role plays for physicians helping them through these processes, and documenting, documenting, documenting. They had, this hospital had a complete file of what they had done, including sending this physician off to a behavior management, anger management course. Um, a significant um, process was in place when this particular incident happened. But, and, and what I say is it, ha it takes two or three people to leaders, medical service professionals, CMOs, uh, VPMAs, medical staff leaders to stay on these uh, cases because in fact I have seen disruptive physician behaviors change and the individuals become excellent citizens of that medical staff. Uh, the best outcomes are always managed very early on uh, and the roughest outcomes are um, sometimes it ends up in the physician being dismissed from the hospital because their care is so disruptive to care, their uh, behavior is so disruptive to care. But the most important point I want to make to our physician colleagues now is the bottom one, which is consider medical staff intervention when unexpected and catastrophic events occur. I couldn't help as I read the depositions. I've also read the physician's suicide note. Uh, this physician loved being a surgeon. He found it painful when patients did not do as well as he expected, uh, but he couldn't imagine himself being anything else but a surgeon. And when I read the depositions of other colleagues around them, they all regretted not stepping in. They all said, why didn't I call the doctor? Why didn't I um, reach out to the physician and see? It may not have made a difference in the outcome, but it might have. So my thoughts here is that if medical staffs, just like as we watch some of our crime and, and uh, uh, programs on TV, when a police officer um, wounds or shoots or kills um, someone, they go through a process of evaluation, a debriefing, and various things are placed around them. Colleagues come forward to help those individuals, and I really encourage uh, this case has made me talk about this a lot. Um, I encourage those listening to really think about what do you do and do it routinely. It doesn't matter 
who the doctor is or what the outcome is, if it's not an expected outcome and, and the patient is harmed, um, reach out. Reach out. Uh, if you have a physician advocate committee or a wellness committee, maybe a referral that direction is helpful. But, uh, but do something. Thanks to the AMA, uh, they have looked at disruptive behavior multiple times. You see a number of resources there. Uh, education modules, three bullets on that, and then also a very good white paper. Uh, I remember reading that immediately when it came out, and then I re-reviewed it uh, for doing this uh, webinar. Uh, there's some very good um, information there. And it also, I think it also helps uh, when disruptive physicians routinely say, you're treating me differently. You just, you just don't like me. You're treating me differently. I'm just going for good patient care and you're treating me differently. Well, yeah, uh, we probably are treating you differently because, in fact, you are different. And, you're, you know, you are reflective of a group of physicians that even the AMA has now decided uh, or did um, do uh, a white paper on because, in fact, you are different. And here's, here's, some, here's a document from our professional organization that talks about it. So what can we do to um, reduce the risk? Uh, it's no surprise, I'm going to say, follow your governance documents. Make sure, number one, that they're current, that they don't look like the Dead Sea Scrolls. I read some bylaws and I wonder when they were ever written. Um, make sure that all of the governance documents, the, uh, the privilege forms, the applications, the reference letters are state of the art. Make sure that the leaders of the medical staff and the medical affairs and your governing body and others are educated. Make sure that you know what your protections are. Um, the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act, the HICWIA we call it. What does your state require? What do your accreditors require? Are you doing every single thing that they're saying? Because if you're not, you could be potentially liable and that's a very easy standard for the plaintiff to point to. And then, uh, as the Miller case talked about, seek knowledgeable counsel to make sure that the medical staff is being advised correctly. Uh, and I would also say seek counsel that tells you how to get something done. Uh, sometimes we have medical staff counsel that tells you why you can't do something. And that just frustrates medical staff leaders because they know they have a clinical problem or a behavior problem, and they're constantly told, nope, you can't do that, you can't do that. Well. We need to have councils that tell us how to get it done so that it can get done and we can move on to other issues. Uh, ensure compliance with CMS and other accreditor standards. Be aware of standards of care, meaning what does the industry recommend? Are, are your leaders going to educational programs and so on? Are the MSPs going to educational programs? Um, adequately train and educate the staff, the credentialing staff physician leaders, committee members, senior management, and board of directors. What we so often hear in this field is it takes too long to get an application done. It just takes too long. Well, when we compromise the time that it takes and we don't adequately resource the function, sometimes things happen and we will spend years, not weeks, years, trying to figure out what to do with this physician that we put on staff that, had, that has disruptive issues. Um, many of you out there with a lot of experience know what that's like, and it's, it's pretty awful. So with that, uh, I'm going to um, check to see whether uh, Aya has any questions that have been submitted. Yeah, so thank you, Carol, for that fantastic presentation. And we will now begin today's question and answer session. So please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box uh, you see on your dashboard, and we will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. We've already had several questions come in, so I'll go ahead and get started with those um, now, Carol. And the first question uh, that came in is, if it is proven that there is no malpractice, no clinical negligence, can a negligent credentialing case still be brought? Yes, because, for example, in the Huron case, that uh, the malpractice was not identified. She, in fact, 
was saying that she was negligently credentialed, negligently discharged, and through the medical staff processes, the credentialing process was not adequate. And that's the case that um, just a couple weeks ago, the judge agreed with that opinion. So yes, it can happen. Um, not so much from the patient standpoint, um, because the malpractice needs, as far as I know, I'm not an attorney, so I always have to say, okay, check with your attorneys, uh, but you would need malpractice to be established first. The patient has to have harm and damages from that harm um, before you could then move into a negligent credentialing, as far as I would understand. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next question that came in. And this person wants to know, um, what types of questions should you ask another hospital when you see a red flag, but all that they give you um, is a letter stating that the physician was a member of the medical staff from this date to this date and no other details? Oh, that's excellent. Um, what has happened over the years is that the, um, the mobility of physicians moving more rapidly than they used to. In, in the old days, a doctor would complete their training, establish in the community, and stay there for 30 years. Now that's not so. And so uh, they uh, are more able to move um, with employment and contract situations. In addition to that, we have lots and lots of managed care people uh, organizations asking information and so the understaffed medical staff services department is unable to really get evaluations completed however we should not accept that standard and I'm sorry to say that because a lot of my MSP colleagues are going oh no 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 no, no. I don't have time I don't have time but in our industry when a letter comes in that says doctor was here from Two, that's a red flag because they're not saying anything else. That's a huge red flag. Number two, if the letter says Dexter was here from two and he was uh, a member in good standing, had full privileges, see the attached copy, um, no issues were ever raised, uh, nursing staff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's a little better. Uh, but it's also the same letter that they send out on every doctor who is a member in good standing. You want to know more. You really want to know how does this doctor uh, manage high-risk obstetrical patients? How does this, uh, uh, what is the outcome of this surgeon's uh, spinal surgeries? You want to know, do they get along with uh, the, the nursing staff? Do they get along with their colleagues, et cetera, et cetera? So the best way is to say, I need the name of a doctor uh, on that staff, uh, send a letter to, you could do to the VPMA or CMO. You could uh, best send to the department chair uh, or section chief if the hospital is very large. They have section chiefs. And it should be a criteria-based evaluation form that asks very specific questions about medical knowledge, clinical skills, technical skills, behavior issues, uh, outcomes on performance, um, obviously they're not going to get into detail. And it should be graded from an excellent down to uh, poor or uh, unknown. Uh, I sometimes see evaluation forms that are utilized by hospitals that say satisfactory and unsatisfactory. Trust me, I've been in this business a very, very long time. Most physicians are never going to mark another doctor as unsatisfactory unless they are really, really unsatisfactory. So you want a gradation because most physicians are excellent. Most physicians practice good care. And then there's very good physicians. There's lots of those. And then there's average. Sometimes average might not be average, but there is average. And you could have a policy in place, for example, uh, at St. Joseph's in, in Joliet. We had a policy where every average was, uh, the evaluation was, uh, the evaluator was contacted by, uh, and I recommend two people, a medical staff professional as well as the physician, the department chair or the credentials chair or someone like that, get on a phone call with the doctor and say, um, average? And sometimes the answer is, well, some people are just average. He's average, he's fine, we had no issues. Other people will say, well, actually, we had some problems with them, and average was what I marked. So 
no stone needs to be unturned when coming to patient care. And medical staff leaders, hospital administration needs to support the function of the medical staff services so this can happen. And um, we need to assure that the doctors that are on our staff and the, and the APPs that are on our staff are qualified and competent because these laborious cases that I've just talked about um, are out there and potentially could come to your institution. Next. Thank you so much, Carol. And I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. But Carol, do you have any final thoughts um, to share with everyone today before we close out the webinar? Um, actually, I probably will do this. Uh, I, I, I am a Chicago Bears fan, and this year it's great fun to be a Chicago Bears fan. Um, and any of you who know anything about football understand that Vince Lombardi, <laughs> the, uh, the Packers, the Green Bay Packers coach, once upon a time said that perfection is unattainable, but if we chase perfection, we will catch excellence. And I often end uh, discussions like this in pointing to that phrase, because if we work on our credentialing processes, our governance documents with medical staff, policies and procedures, uh, resourcing adequately, we may not get the perfect credentialing process and the perfect outcomes, but we will get exceptional. We will get excellent care for our patients and excellent processes for ourselves. So I want to thank everyone uh, on this call for spending the time. I want to thank the AMA for devoting the resources to doing this. And I wish everyone uh, good luck and, uh, and a good football season. <laughs> thank you so much, Carol. That's a great note to, to wrap things up on today. Um, so once again, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, and thank you to the American Medical Association for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.